finish at two hours. Can you recall it? Yes, Alhamdulillah. Hold this. Could you be sure you order to the hand? Yeah, I can't find my hand. Hand on this is a strength. Yeah, it's a good one. It's a good one. Yeah, it's a good one. It's a good one. It's a good one. It's a Pleasant view, kind of. Good comment. Eight, ten, ten minutes. No. Mujib ki thi kaise shi? Mujib abhi shi ne ye apna gate aash le kar daa kaise hai? Wo ta maine di ye tarjeta. Naam tiki. Ah, naam tiki. Ha, main naam. Wo ta aash le kaise hai? Shi shi apna kaise hai? Aye, kena. आखिर बस में तो फक्त तो कोई टेबल सीन है। ना मार्टी कैसे लोग अपना रुश पास स्टम मुझे बुद्धि नहीं चाहिए। स्टम मुझे पास स्टम मुझे अपना ये ऐसे मजिद वाली तार पर एमसीएनज तार पर अपना रच ये मस्जिद अल्लाह मस्जिद अल्लाह का तो हमसे तब वो ये थे प्लेन फील्ड पर से अपना ये Yes, yes. 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 Sorry to make you wait. We lost our way. This was our first time to this beautiful place. Salam. We are my youngest Christian here. Salam alaikum. Might be a little. We need a connector. Okay, so just one second. Yes. Oh, really we should have one.
today we are going to break the 100 year old record of how cold it's going to be. <laughs> happening with this <laughs> turning on oh we looked everywhere except well i'm not even sure if this one is going to turn it on or not. okay good alhamdulillah yes all right mashallah uh this one is good Okay. So how much time do we have here? Well, we have Maghrib at um, 5.30? Yeah, that's right. Maghrib is around about 5.35 or so. Okay. And then we have till 6.30. Uh, okay, so uh, from about 45 minutes. So we leave like 10 minutes before. So people like me, we can go and do our fresh wazoo and after that. Yeah. yeah okay. Okay. Uh, let's start. Should we start or somebody's coming? So just a brief, very quick uh, intro for coming. Uh, this is an event sponsored by MCMC and the Relief. Uh, we, are, we are a relief organization that works domestically in the United States. We do hunger prevention, uh, women's shelters, uh, disaster relief. And today, um, Brother Nasser is going to be giving us a good um, a workshop about building beautiful minds, self development. He's a graduate from Yale, and um, inshallah, you will enjoy the program. Um, building Beautiful Minds. We started working on this a uh, few years back. Um, let me change this. Uh, it's February now. Um, I'm sure you, all of you are aware of what's happening in the Ummah. Uh, one of the challenges we are facing as individual Muslims and as an Ummah is that uh, we have become the international football for everybody, whether it's Paris or it is California, uh, whether it's Iraq or Syria or Lebanon or Yemen or Afghanistan or Pakistan or uh, wherever you go, you feel as you have this feeling of being the international punching bag. Uh, after 9-11, we started thinking what's happening, and we realized that over the last 30 years, people have changed. And the biggest change is within the Ummah rather than without. Uh, and towards this end, we said, OK, what has happened? And this actually is a group effort. Many, many people shared with me what's going on. I'm a teacher. I'm not an alim. So as a teacher, I asked myself something very simple that, you know, what has happened? So the first thing we understood was very powerful, and that is that uh, all of us sitting in this room and beyond, uh, 
in the city, in the masjid, the community, United States, the Ummah. We are individually defined by the quality of our minds. So whatever you are doing, it really is a function of the quality of your mind. Uh, good, bad, ugly, that's it. So if you think you are successful in your job, it's because you have a mind that works well in your job situation. If you think you are successful as a uh, husband, a wife, a brother, a sister, a son, daughter, mother, so it's because your mind is good in those relationships. So this is the challenge that uh, over a period of time you will only rise as your mind keeps on improving and you will stagnate if it doesn't improve, you will fall if it starts seg stagnating. Uh, and I think Allah in His wisdom, when He wants to give barakah to somebody, He gives them a good thought. So every time you see yourself doing well, you close your eyes and say, oh, you know, I thought of this, I did this, and Alhamdulillah, doors opened. That's coming from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And every time when uh, things go mess up, uh, especially when it's our fault, you will find that somehow my, I, knew, I knew what I was doing, but I was mentally paralyzed. I couldn't take the better option. For whatever reason, I took the option which led me to where I am. So Allah doesn't hit us with sticks. He just helps us in changing our mind. So I'm very clear about this. We are as happy and as sad as our minds are. Now that's the first challenge. The second challenge is that individually we are nothing. Uh, if you want to be a happy person like myself, a man, uh, whether you like it or not, you need a spouse. You need a spouse who can support you. You need children who can, you can live with. You have to maintain your relationships. So it's not only individually that we are defined by the quality of our mind, but it's also how we interact with each other. So it's the connectivity and the individual quality. So both of them go together. Now, for the individual level, you need to think about how to improve the quality of your mind. But for living with others, you need to focus on your mamlat. Mamlat is, uh, how do you behave with people? Uh, what is your ikhlaq? Uh, how trustworthy are you? Because every relationship depends upon one word, trustability. And one of the challenges I give to people and to myself is think about the most precious thing in your life, whether it's money, it's asset, anything. How many people do you trust with the most precious thing in your life, number one? Uh, number two, uh, how many people trust me with the most precious thing in their life? And what you will find is something very strange that very few people in the Ummah trust each other, especially when it comes to precious things. And I'll give you an example. Uh, I was in Florida and I met this wonderful, wonderful young man who is, I think, 62 or 63 years old. And he recently lost his wife. And before passing away, this lady was had started working in a factory like one year or two years before she passed away. And the company insured her. And he, after she passed away, the company actually they came and gave him a check for $50,000. You know, he was in that grief, you know, he told people, you know, what do I do with this money? I don't even know what to do. And one of our uh, brothers in Dean, he says, I'll tell you what to do. You give the money to me and I'll invest it for you and you have five children, you have two daughters to marry and, yeah, and I'll help you, you know. I know how to increase this money and invest it and uh, I'll make sure that your needs are met. Now, all of you, you have lived in the United States with Doma. Guess what happened? This is half the story. Who will tell me the second half of the story? 
lost his money. Yeah. He lost it. The, the, the guy gave him some profit for a few months. And then one day he said, it's gone. Uh, this is such a familiar story, wherever you go. What, what is happening is that the ability to trust each other is not there. You cannot build a society where people do not trust each other. Now, this is the challenge. In your entire universe, there is one person you can control. Who is that? Yourself. Yeah. I never believed this. I actually tried controlling my spouse, and look what happened to me. <laughs> See the hair? It's all gone. Uh, actually, I even tried controlling my mother-in-law, who weighs 90 pounds. And I had to kind of stay away from my house for two, three days. Um, I tried controlling my children. Couldn't do it. Um, I have a farm back home in Pakistan where the people who work for me, I pay them salaries. I can't control them. And ultimately, I understood that there's just one person I can control in the whole universe, and his name is Nasser Aziz. That's me. Now, I cannot control whether people around me are trustworthy. But what can I control? That I am trustworthy. So if people steal from me, cheat me, I can either become like them or I can learn the lessons from my Prophet Sallam and say, throughout his 23 years of Dawa, there were people who were not only cheating, lying, but wanting to kill him. But look at what he taught us. He says, only Allah can change them, but we should try and change ourselves. So building beautiful minds is an effort to understand the process of change in the deen. Uh, 1400 years ago, Prophet Sallam, throughout from the first day of his dawah till his last breath, the biggest thing he taught his companions that nobody talks about is how to build a beautiful mind. And beautiful mind has basically two elements, the ability to become good and the ability to live with others. So one of the qualities of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is that Allahul Jameel, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is beautiful. Yahubul Jamal, and he loves beauty. So whenever a Muslim or a Muslim learns to develop a beautiful mind, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is kind to them as, they were, as he was kind to the Sahaba Karam. Why? Because Rasulullah Sallam, the biggest thing he taught his companions was to build a beautiful mind. And these companions, they taught the Tabaeen how to build a beautiful mind. And guess what the Tabaeen did? They taught it to the Taba Tabaeen. This process was so powerful that Alhamdulillah, even today, people like myself, somebody taught us that, you know, when things are going wrong, we have to go back to the basics and learn to build a beautiful mind. And we are trying to share with you the process. So this process actually comes from the seed of Prophet Sallam and the Quran. Uh, if I make a mistake, correct me. If I say something which is not right, may Allah forgive me. And if there's any khair in this, <coughs> goodness, may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala accept it and multiply it for all of us. So how does the building of beautiful mind start? It starts with understanding that our financial status may be very, very different for each and every one of us. But the basic resources to succeed in life are tremendous. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given us all tremendous resources to succeed in life. Uh, I'll just give you an example. Two of the richest Sahaba Karam in the life of Prophet Sallam were Hazrat Usman bin Affan Talano and Hazrat Abdul Rahman bin Auf Talano. They were the Warren Buffets of their time. So they had resources, not only physical, but uh, 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 capital resources. Very, very rich Sahaba Karam. So they, it was easy for them to build a beautiful mind. But think about Hazrat Bilal Rizdalan. How much money did he have? He was a slave. 
Think about Zaid bin Haris, a slave. Think about Hazrat Samia who dies. Nothing. Uh, Hazrat Ans, nothing. So there was all this group of Sahaba Karam who had nothing, but they learned to build a beautiful mind. And also there were these people who were very, very rich, and they also learned to live. So the idea is that it doesn't matter what my economic situation is. As long as I have a beautiful mind, I learn to build it, I can succeed in this world, or at least try to succeed in this world, and also try to succeed in the hereafter. So the resources Allah gives us, what he wants, us, wants to see is, what do we do with these resources? I call them results because I'm a teacher and teachers like results, you know, A, B, Cs. So he, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is extremely interested in what do we do with them and what are the results that we produce. Now, in order to make this conversion happen, Allah has given us a very beautiful, magnificent, powerful thing. Uh, we call it the mind. It's our ability to think. Now, Quran says that some people mind, use their minds with hikmah. Hikmah is wisdom in English. And these people, they are extremely powerful, magnificent people. Uh, I call them gardeners, people who use their minds with hikmah. Uh, gardeners have this unique ability that if you give them a barren piece of land, they'll convert it into a garden. You give them a, a useless person who everybody says he's useless, and this gardener will convert him into a magnificent person. Um, they actually use minimum resources to produce tremendous results. Now, over the last four years, I've been doing this program at different masajid. We have gone to about more than 150 masajid in more than 15 states. One of the things I've found is that almost every masjid has a history of a gardener behind it. Uh, if you look at how this masjid was built, I'll bet you anything that many years ago, some families got together and they said, let's pray together. And one of the brothers or sisters offered their basement or their hall to pray. And as soon as people found out that space filled up, and they said, this is not going to work, let's rent a musalla. And they rented a musalla, and as people found out, the musalla overflowed. And what should we do now? Let's collect funds, buy a some land, and then build a masjid. Every masjid has the same story. So the gardeners, they were responsible for uh, this, uh, alhamdulillah, uh, development of the masajid. And the ultimate is when they set up an Islamic school, it starts usually with Saturday school, Sunday school, and then a full-time Islamic school. Now this is the challenge that these people with hikmah, they start this, and then somewhere along the line, shaitan comes in. And he says, ah, oh, you gave money. Uh, you helped in building this masjid. What did you get out of it? And one of the people, you know, the mind becomes unwise. And he says, I want to stand for president because you are not doing this. And then, the split starts. I have gone to so many masajid, beautiful, magnificent masajid, and there were three musallis, four musallis. I said, what happened? And I found out these parasites, I call these people who don't use hikmah, parasites, and greedy woodcutters. They made a separate group, went 10 blocks down, bought land, made it, started a new masjid. It is heartbreaking, especially in America, where, they are, where we are trying to find an identity, uh, trying to raise our children in the deen, that these parasites, the gardeners are here, the parasites are here. And what the parasite does is, is uses the massive resources of the community to produce negative results. So one of the things we understood was very simple, that 30 years ago, 40 years ago, predominantly the ummah had Gardeners sprinkled all over in families, in schools, in colleges, and universities. And these gardeners were not only taking care of the resources, of, but they're also taking care of the people. 
And over a period of time, the biggest tragedy is without us noticing it, uh, our communities have been taken over by parasites. There are parasites in the family, there are parasites in friends, there are parasites in the masjid, the community. Uh, our presidents and prime ministers and kings, they have become super parasites. So my challenge was what to do. So one of the first things we tried to do was distinguish between a gardener and a parasite. And what we found was something very powerful, that the biggest difference is how they think. And this is what we found, that a gardener in any situation is always thinking about what? Giving back. They, they love to give back to their families, to their parents, siblings, back home in the United States. They love to give back to the community, anybody in need, the masjid, uh, the nation, the ummah. They're always thinking about giving. While a parasite or a woodcutter guess, what is he always thinking about? How can I take from others? This is their biggest thing in life, uh, taking and collecting and becoming richer, more famous, and uh, uh, more powerful. So then we said, OK, if this is so, where is it coming from? And actually, it's very powerful uh, that these gardeners, they somehow learn over a period of time to develop the intention of khair, of goodness. And it is not uh, with this intention of khair and goodness, they give not only in the 30 days of Ramadan or in the Friday when the box is passed, but 24-7, uh, 365 days a year, they're always thinking about giving, giving, giving. So they learn to actually give with commitment and responsibility. Some of these people I know, they get up in the morning and they make this dua, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, just create an opportunity to, for me to give somebody, to help somebody, to care for somebody. Uh, whether it's their spouse, whether it's their children, anywhere, they're always looking for these opportunities. Beautiful people. And uh, with the parasite, what we see happening is that over a period of time, knowingly or unknowingly, they cultivate the intention of sharp, which is uh, taking. Uh, and once this is cultivated, it's not like uh, once in a life or once a year or once a month or once a week. It's 24-7, 365 days a year. You know, they're always thinking, how can I take this? It becomes second nature. They actually judge themselves uh, in terms of cleverness and intelligence by how much I've taken from others. So my challenge was, where is it coming from? Basically, uh, can you see it? Yeah. yeah. Okay. Good. So uh, uh, when a child is born, basically that child is an unconditional taker in the sense that they do not give you anything material, but just smiles and maybe some uh, lovely moments. But in return, they want to be fed, clothed, showered, uh, changed. Uh, over a period of time, we teach our child that this is your pacifier, this is your milk bottle, these are your shoes, your clothes, part of education, uh, your books, uh, your school, your report card. Uh, then you start telling them, oh, you know, this is uh, your, uh, uh, you have to work after graduation. And he says, oh, this is my job. And then the child says, this is my salary. And then there comes a time when he say, or she says, this is my spouse, this is my house. And then something strange starts happening. You know, uh, the, the, I call this the collector's mentality. Oh, these are my investments. This is my car. And you know, uh, they will park their muck in front of you so you can notice it. Or they will do the boom thing in which the tires burn to make sure that you have seen him driving his uh, super fast M series Beamer. Um, uh, and if uh, it's a lady, she will flash her rocks, you know, uh, talk like this and this so that people can notice that it's a huge stone uh, which has cost a fortune. So this collection mentality uh, is designed to impress others. What we forget is, uh, uh, actually we also do it with our cell phones. I remember when the first time cell phones came back home in Pakistan, it used to weigh about two and a half kilos. And uh, it was a set, with, you, most probably you haven't seen it. You, just, you had to carry it like this. And they would bring it to the party and they will tell some of their friends or wife to call me from the landline so they can pick it up and say, hello. 
you know, and then they would notice and they'll say, where's your wire? And he said, oh, this is the new cell phone. It's without wireless. So that uh, thing is built in by the shaitan. Uh, but one of the things we all forget is that there comes a day when everything is taken away from us unconditionally. And that's the day which Quran says that every one of us will have to taste death. On that day, something very powerful happens. We give up everything unconditionally. Everything that we have painstakingly collected from our birth to our death is taken away. Uh, I would like to share this something very personal with you. I have two sons. One is, alhamdulillah, 24. The other is 22. Uh, I held them in my arms just a few minutes after they were born. And I promise you, they didn't come with anything in this world, nothing. I have also buried my father with my own hands. He was a rich man, rich here, rich here, and also lots of things he had. I still remember his pristine white clothes which he used to wear. I remember his beautiful shoes. I remember his uh, leather wallet, always full of money, overflowing. I also remember his beautiful Philip Pate watch. I still don't dare to wear it because it's so nice and it reminds me of him. Very nice, always fond of nice things. But do you know, didn't take anything with him. Everything was left behind. So what's the challenge? This is the paradigm. We don't come with anything, we don't take anything. So where does it come from? <coughs> As a Muslim, uh, when you do the tadabur and tafakkur, as Quran says we are supposed to do, you realize everything comes from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Everything is taken away from him. Wahi awwal, wahi akhir. He's the, there before us, he'll be there after us. Wahi zahir, he's outside. And, sorry, this is my salah. salah. And he's also in my heart, he's also in my life, everywhere. So this is the challenge. If everything is his, who are we? We are the custodians, the ameen of the things he has given us. Every single thing I have, I'm nothing but an ameen. And what is the job of ameen? To dispose of his things according to the desire of the creator, the Rabb who gave us. And how do we do it? That's just one rule. Give it to people who need it, whether it's your spouse, your children, your parents, your akraba, your neighbors, anybody who is in need, you should help them. They are emana, they are, they are, you're a custodian. But unfortunately, many of us forget, and the woodcutters and parasites, they learn to take and collect as much as they can, give back as little as you can. You have to give back to the utility companies, you have to give back to uh, whoever you buy things from. But you take as much as you can. And the idea is that the difference between taking and giving is what? <coughs> what do we call it? Profit. You guys don't go to the business school. I went to the business school just to understand how to make profit. And why do you make profit? To collect and this accumulation of wealth is success. So if you sit in a community, uh, especially in a masjid or in a house where you're having a party, uh, invariably, most of us, we evaluate each other that, oh, he's richer than I am, or I am richer than him uh, through the models of the cars, through the clothes we wear, through the food we eat, through how our, uh, the location of our houses, um, the size of our houses, uh, the size of rocks my spouse wears. Um, it is like somehow we have learned to just evaluate, assess people and say, oh, he's well off or he, I'm better off than him. So this is the woodcutter business, always uh, measuring people in terms of wealth. But uh, the gardeners, are, uh, 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 they learn to share and give everything unconditionally. Just to share with you, when my Prophet ﷺ was born, uh, everything left by his father who had died months before him, uh, some horses, uh, camels, goats and sheep, they had disappeared. 
So there was nothing in the house of Bibi Amna to celebrate his birth, Salasana. Nothing. You know, we had this thing called uh, Bara Wafat or Eid Milad, you know, when people go out and they cook. In his house, the day he was born, there was nothing to celebrate his birth, period. And I also want to share with you, there's a tradition that says that when he was dying, uh, the last uh, 10 days of his illness, he asked Bibi Aisha, what is there in the house? And she says, there are a few coins. And she said, uh, please give them away. I don't want to meet Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala with anything in my house. The last tradition about his, the last night, uh, he was extremely unwell, he was in pain. And Bibi Aisha throughout the night was massaging him to ease the pain. And this tradition says there was no oil in the lamp in the house of Prophet So he was born with nothing. He went with nothing in his house. Uh, and this, uh, this, this lifestyle is so beautifully explained in the Quran when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala asked the Prophet to share with his companions, Kul inna salati wa nusuki wa mahyaya wa mamati lillahi rabbil alameen. And a very humble translation of this, very powerful ayahs, please tell them that all my salah, all my ibadah, all my sacrifices, my life and my death are only for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And uh, once you understand this ayah, you, you feel that 365 degrees, everything you have belongs to Allah. Even my life, my breath, everything is His. So we have to learn to share and care, to help each other become better, because that ultimately is how we build a beautiful mind and how we integrate ourselves into the society. So our challenge was to understand what drives a parasite, why people become parasites. The biggest reason people become parasites is that knowingly or unknowingly, they develop a lifestyle in which their life is governed by their needs. So the three biggest needs which convert, can convert any normal good human being into a parasite. The first one is hubbe mal. Hubbe mal is love for money. And uh, when you have this disease, it just consumes you. And then you forget about what's halal, what's haram, what is tayyab, what's not tayyab, uh, what is hair, what doesn't have hair. And you just go for numbers. I want more, more, more. Now, hubbe mal is very powerful. It can strike the poorest of the poor. It can strike the richest of the rich. And one should ask Allah's forgiveness to help us from uh, save us from hubbe mal. The second one is uh, hubbe ja. I just closed it. I'm sorry. Uh, this phone is a smartphone, and I don't know how it works. It's too smart for me. I tried to put it on uh, m minimum. So hubbe ja is a search for significance, and they want to feel important. That's why they fight elections to be the president and the secretary of the masjid and uh, to be, the, you know, prime minister and presidents. The hubbe ja is so powerful. It also consumes people. People will do anything right and wrong, make false pro promises. Uh, actually, you're going through this process in the United States where all these debates, people are saying, I'll do this, I'll do this, and the other people. And sometimes they're... The, try and speak the truth, sometimes they're lying, uh, sometimes they know this can't be done, sometimes they are trying to just get the votes to become elected. So, and the third thing is power. The power to make and break people is extremely intoxicating. So these are the three major elements which we feel uh, are, are driving uh, people from ordinary people, if they, they get infected, in, in, infected by uh, hubbe mal, hubbe significance, and hubbe power, uh, and they become a parasite. So how does a gardener save himself from becoming a parasite? He or she learns to live his or her life according to the values of the deen. Now, the deen is very powerful. Uh, it teaches us that 
if you think you will be afflicted by hope mal then there is a very simple dua you can make to save yourself and this dua is so powerful it can actually uh, transform the way you live and the dua is very simple you ask allah subhanahu wa ta'ala allah subhanahu wa ta'ala please give me only that risk what you're saying is this country united states is the richest country in the world there is so much risk that's it's thousand times enough for everybody living here but then this uh, gardener says allah give me only that risk which is halal and tayyib what does that mean more money is, is made in lotos than i mean you can make in a lifetime you know these people who buy a lotto ticket they can make this gardener says i don't want that you can make money in a gambling den he says i don't want that you can make tremendous money by selling liquor he says i don't want that you can make money selling cigarettes he says i don't want that in this whole world he says ya allah give me that which is halal and tayyib and then he says give me from the halal and tayyib only that risk which has khair and barakah which is good for me so even i don't want the halal i from that give me the portion that is good for me why if i have too much guess what to happen it may not be good for me it may not be good for my children it may not be good for my wife so you decide you know me you may know my spouse you know my children you decide how much of it is good for me so being halal and tayyib is not enough it should have khair and barakah in it so much so much money that i can prosper in my heart in my mind in my body and my soul as your servant and the la- second thing is he also likes significance you know it's nice to be told oh you are a good mali and it can become extremely intoxicating so this person when he reads the quran in search of significance and when he comes to the saya what to is zaman tasha but to zil man tasha be ya dekal khair he really understands that all the significance comes from allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and people who seek significance on the path of allah subhanahu wa ta'ala they do it in their ruku and in the sujood in the zikr and in the sala and in the siyam and qiyam and zakat and hajj and that's where you're actually looking for significance in the path of allah subhanahu wa ta'ala so my yeah thank you uh the last thing power often when i read the seera of prophet sallam you know as a child i would look at you know how powerful the muslims were they defeated the kufar in uh, badr and in uh, khandaq and, and throughout his life rasul sallam was except for uhud he was always successful but you know it's very a uh, powerful to understand his greatest achievement was his ability and his greatest power came from his ability to change the minds of his sahaba karam before the dawa the sahaba karam were ordinary people living the life of the tribes of uh, arabia uh, whether they were in Quray- in quraish in makkah or uh, avas and khazraj in madina wherever they were they were just d- dictated by the environment but then rasul sallam taught them how to build a beautiful mind <coughs> and these people they not only learned how to do it they passed it on on and on till such time that it reached most of us here in this room so that's the beauty of a gardener while he can work with barren land he can also work with barren minds and uh, that's where the power comes from he may not have the bank balance to uh, really be actually his bank balance most of people would be ashamed how much bank balance because banks are empty uh, not many assets but a huge heart he beautiful mind and tremendous courage to share what he has or she has so what happens in the life of a gardener when they live their life with their values with the intention of goodness giving with commitment and responsibility they actually build and contribute 
they leave this world a better place for themselves, for their families, the community, the nation in Ummah. And when a critical number of gardeners do that collectively, weaving themselves in a society like the people of Medina did in the time of Rasulullah Sallam, <coughs> after his passing away. You know what they can do? In the next 30 to 50 years, they change the course of history of mankind. Um, two of the greatest empires in the world at that time, they just melted. Uh, it's very difficult to explain <coughs> what melting is in this freezing weather because uh, nothing will melt. Um, Everything freezes. But if you want to really understand melting, buy a ticket to Florida. Uh, go to Miami. It's about 70, 80 degrees there, I hope, uh, unless Miami is also freezing. And you take a piece of chocolate, like buy Cadbury, put it in one hand, and uh, put a cube of ice, and stand in the sun I mean, it's 70, 80 degrees. And what, do you, what will you find after five minutes? You don't have to fight uh, the chocolate and that cube. They will just melt. These armies, the, 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 the Mujahideen went there, but they actually melted. And this is the power of a beautiful mind by itself, connecting with other beautiful minds and looking for khair. Things melt. My submission is that what you are seeing in California, what you are seeing in Paris, what you are seeing in um, Donald Trump, is because most of us, unfortunately, even the best of us, we are living our lives according to our needs. The masjids are here. But as soon as we go out of the masjid, what are we doing? We are living a life according to our needs. And with the intention of collecting as much as we can, because that's where we originally came to this country for. Uh, I know of very few people who come to United States to serve the deen. Most of us, we came here for a very simple purpose, make money. Um, and with commitment and responsibility, we want to do that 24-7. So all the time we spend outside the masjid, that's what we're doing. Now, ultimately we become parasites and woodcutters. But this is the problem. The people who have been living here before us, the Yehud and Nasara, in the profession of being parasites and woodcutters, they are better than us. And you know what happens to the weakest student in the class? People bully him. We are being bullied. Why? Because in this game, we are the worst. But in the game of the deen, which is becoming a gardener, uh, living your life with your values, with the intention of khair, giving commitment, responsibility, I tell you, nobody can touch us because that's what Prophet ﷺ taught his companions. The Quraysh were a thousand times richer than the Sahaba Karam. They had better businesses, better armies. Everything was a thousand times better. But over a period of time, I think it was 5th Hijra. What was the year of the Fatah Makkah? 5th? 8th? 5th? 7th. OK. The, I mean, within seven years, even Makkah melted. There was no fight. Not an arrow was thrown. Not a sword was drawn. It just melted. And this is the power of gardeners. By themselves, that's how Rasulullah started. And then joining hands. So that's what the message is. <clears throat> My submission is very simple. When a <coughs> parasite, knowingly or unknowingly, they live their life according to their needs with the intention of taking with commitment and responsibility, they demolish and destroy everything that's been built. We were just uh, visiting one of our elders, uh, uh, Brother Farooq Raza. He lives about 15 minutes from here. And he was sharing with us, Syria is totally destroyed. One of the oldest civilizations in Islam, <coughs> even before Islam, totally, utterly destroyed. Iraq, totally utterly destroyed. Yemen, destroyed. Afghanistan, destroyed. Libya, destroyed. It's uh, like if you build a house, it takes you how long? Six months, nine months, year? 
especially if you build it lovingly with the designer flows and things, maybe longer. But how long does it take a fire to destroy your house? That's what's happened to the Ummah. Look, five countries totally, utterly destroyed. Pakistan has gone back maybe 50 years because of what's happening there. The parasites, the woodcutters. So our challenge is very simple. How do we go back? Why? Because I like I shared with you, in the whole Ummah there's one person we can control. And what we want to do is, the same thing which Prophet Sallam did, one person at a time. We want to come back to where he started. How do you do that? Uh, we, actually, he's our role model. And we, whatever I'm sharing with you, I've tried to pick it up from his life. And if I'm, uh, I hope I'm, I'm sharing with you the right things. A beautiful, the biggest challenge we had was, can we build a beautiful mind by design in this world, which is governed by the Dick Cheney's, the Bushes, the Enrons, the Madoffs, the Trumps of this world? And if yes, then how? That, how do we do it? Uh, without them even knowing what we are trying to do, but how do we do it? Our strategy was very simple. If you really look at our world, uh, I borrowed this from computers. I didn't know about this existed before I first used my first computer. Uh, my body is my hardware, my clothes, this laptop, my cell phone, uh, jacket, everything I own is hardware. Uh, this city is hardware. Uh, the, state of, uh, um, I think this is New Jersey, right? I'm so confused, New York, Pennsylvania, and Egypt. So this is all hardware. The United States is hardware. Uh, the whole world, sun, moon, stars, galaxy, the universe is hardware. Now, what is the software in this world? It's how we think. Now, this is the challenge. If we want to improve our lot, and always think about yourself first, because on the Day of Judgment, we won't have to answer for the Ummah, I'll have to answer for myself. Uh, my spouse, because I would like her to be there with, my, with me in Jannah. My children, my community, my family, my nation, the Ummah. So what is more important, hardware or software? My first instinct as an MBS uh, person was, we are going down because we are poor. And Americans are going up because they're rich. And then I realized that if that was the case, then Prophet ﷺ would have asked for Ohud to turn into gold so he could give his companions enough money to uh, be on the deen. But instead, he refused. So hardware is not the key to reverting the ummah back to where it should be. And then we understood that maybe it was the software. And one of my friends, he said, Nasir, just look at from the first day of his dawah till his last breath, what was Prophet ﷺ asking his companions to change? Their houses, their spouses, uh, their horses? No, he said, change the way you think. So if that's the case, then maybe we need to again go back to the drawing board and change the way we think. But then we said, OK, what is actually happening in Noma? And I, I'll share with you something very powerful. Uh, all of you have something which we call disposable income. Disposable income is the money you spend after you have done everything else, like you're paid for the rent, you're paid for children's schooling. Uh, what do we Muslims do with our disposable income? Better houses, better cars, better clothes, or better biryani. I know people who go to uh, Givon in Chicago just to eat uh, biryani and nehari from uh, Sabri, or they go to Tahura to buy two kilos of uh, mitai. Uh, uh, we love spending money on these things. But how many people want to improve their software so Allah can bless us in this world and the hereafter? This masjid must be having hundreds of musallis. How many people have showed up? We as a nation are enamored by the Yahud and Nasara. And I'll tell you what's happening to Yahud and Nasara. 
uh, on these trips to New York when I'm teaching, I go and do sessions in masjids, which had previously been churches. Now think it through, what happened to that church? Over a period of time, the number of congregation had dropped, and there came a time that the people could not support the expenses of the church, and the church was forced to sell its property. So the software has changed in them. They are going flat out to make wealth and money. The Muslims are buying synagogues. I went to this beautiful synagogue in New York. It was amazing. And you know what happened to that synagogue? The Jews were very smart. They had put up something called an endowment fund because they realized that the population is shrinking. They wanted the synagogue to be there forever. And if you want something to be there forever, the only way to do it in this uh, uh, financial world is you set up an endowment fund with enough income. But here is where Allah comes in. There was a man called Madoff. He says, I'll help you in making enough money to take care of this. And guess what Madoff did with the money uh, for the synagogue? It was a Ponzi scheme. It disappeared and they had to sell it. And who bought it? The Muslims. But this is our challenge. If you look at the musallis of the masjid, most of them are people with mature age. Where are our children? What will happen to this masjid when we are too old to come? Who will be standing here? My biggest fear is that it took them hundreds of years to sell their masajid, their churches and synagogues, which the Muslims will be doing in the next few decades. In Chicago, the most beautiful masjid is in North Folk. Who built it? The Bosnians. When they went away in search of their need for uh, jobs, for many years that masjid was closed. The Imam was there, he would often not open it. And unfortunately, unfortunately, people started renting out the masjid. <laughs>
Because in this country, it's very hard to live without a job. Especially if you're a true Punjabi, you know, you always spend more than what you earn. So at the end of the day, <laughs> you know, most people from Punjab are... Okay. Is this immediately? Salah or the five ten? Huh? So Prophet Salah teaches us how to give our zakat, how to give our charity. How do you, um, I don't know. <laughs> I'm not very good at it. Well, I just uh, um, do my... Start it? Well, no, just one second. Um, let's see. If, uh, okay. No, sorry. Good. Yeah, but my slide is on and it's stuck on the both sides. Uh, okay, so you're sharing this, but uh, it's not projecting? Yeah. No, let me. Just yeah, it's coming. Yeah, it's coming. I'm dead. I'm going to go fast because uh, I, sorry, I didn't keep track of time. Uh, one of the things uh, which we have found is something very simple. Our strategy is very simple. We, I cannot, I don't know enough about making money to make you rich, but alhamdulillah, from what little I know of the Quran and the Seerah, I can share with you what we have learned about building beautiful minds. And that's why our strategy is very simple. And we are following the same strategy as Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, that when he wanted to spread the deen, he focused on building beautiful minds rather than houses, spouses, horses. So our strategy is to facilitate the building of beautiful minds. The first step is personal excellence. This is what he taught in the first 13 years of Dawah in Mecca. Uh, so you see these people who were really grounded into the deen, their connection with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and beautiful, magnificent values. And when they come to Medina after the Hijrah, the first thing Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa teaches them is how to work together when he connects one Ansar with one Mahajir. Uh, and lastly, over the next nine years in Medina, he teaches them leadership. And before he leaves the world, he leaves some beautiful, magnificent leaders who change the course of history. Now, uh, this is uh, 
what a mind is. Mind is basically the software of the brain. So each and every one of us, alhamdulillah, God has given us a brain. And the quality of our success depends primarily upon the quality of the software. With most of us, it develops by default. 10% is genetic and 90% is uh, uh, the environment we live in. So think of it like this. Uh, if our parents, uh, uh, alhamdulillah, are extremely pious, uh, genetically, we have that piety of deen. But if we are raised, let's suppose, astaghfirullah, in the environment, let's say, due to some accident, we are raised uh, in the environment of the biggest gambling den in the United States, which is Caesar Palace, Las Vegas. And as a child, I grew up there. Like, you see these children running around in the masjid? I, as a child, am running around in Caesar Palace while uh, you know, looking at gamblers and those noises when people make a fortune and uh, you know, learning what uh, different games are. So when I grow up, what sort of a person will I be? I'll share with you, because Pakistan is full of them. I will go to the masjid because of the piety of my parents. I'll have a mahrab here on my knees and my ankles. There'll be the nishan of salah. Uh, I would uh, fast, do sayam and qayam. I would give zakat, I'll do hajj. I'll be giving, I'll be the most generous person giving mon money in the masjid to every charity. But when you ask me what do I do, guess what I will be doing? What will be I best at? Something which I grew up in, which is gambling. And is that halal or haram? Totally, absolutely haram. And you see this so many times, astaghfirullah, with so many brothers, that they are on the deen, they come to the masjid, they are giving, they're doing everything right, except that the source is wrong. So my challenge is, we are raising our children in an environment, back home and in the United States, which we don't even understand. The shaitan is striking from every which way it can. So what do we do? Uh, there's this beautiful story in the Quran which tells us how to fight the genes and the environment, despite of them. How do you walk the path of Allah subhanahu wa and this is the story of Hazrat Musa alayhi uh, salam. He came from a family of people who had been enslaved for hundreds of years by the people of Pharaoh. So when you are enslaved, your genes become weak, and over a period of time you become subservient. You just follow others. And if you really want to understand it, read the history of the United States. After the Civil War, when the uh, African-American brothers, they were uh, uh, given independence. Uh, uh, they ran away from their plantations, dancing on the streets that we are free. And when it was time to eat and they were hungry, guess what they couldn't do? They had not learned to earn a meal. So what did they do? They came back to their masters. They came back to the same sleeping houses where they were locked and they begged to be fed. Hazrat Musa salam, because of hundreds of years of slavery, his genetically, he was a weak person. On top of that, he was raised in the most corrupt house in Egypt, the house of Pharaoh. So logically, according to this explanation, which was given to me, given to me by one of the top Muslim neurologists in Florida, he should have been Nauzubillah, a weak person with Nauzubillah very corrupt practices. Instead, you see this beautiful, magnificent prophet, you know, walking across history, the most mentioned prophet in Quran. And I asked my teacher what happened. And he said, Nasir, in any environment we live in, Allah gives us khair, which is goodness, and shar, which is evil. Now, the challenge is, with the niyyah of goodness, what do we focus on? So, in that environment, if you focus on the goodness, then Allah does something very beautiful. He makes that goodness a part of you. But if you focus on the evil, he will make that evil part of you. So in case of Hazrat Musa as a child, he focused on the goodness of Bibi Asiya, the vice of Iran. And Allah, with his graciousness, made that goodness a part of his person. And as he grew up, he went, started going to the court. He saw the uh, arrogance of uh, the Pharaoh and his leadership. So he decided to focus on the leadership part, and Allah made that a part of Hazrat Musa. 
And then when he has to run away to Madian because accidentally he kills a man, and he meets his future father-in-law. And this wise man, he offers the sweetest deal under the sun ever given to any son-in-law. That for eight to ten years of service, I'll give you one of my daughters. In Pakistan, it's lifetime of service. <laughs> so, yeah, most of these people, young people won't understand this. <laughs> you have to experience it. Uh, okay. Uh, so, Hazrat Musa alayhi salam, in those eight to ten years, he focuses on the wisdom of his father-in-law. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives him wisdom. So now when you see Hazrat Musa alayhi salam, what do you see? Goodness, leadership, wisdom. So I told my teacher, but he was a prophet. I am a teacher, a broken teacher coming from a totally, what do they call us, ABCDs, uh, American confused, Desis or whatever it is. Totally confused you. I don't know what, where to go. And what did my teacher tell me? He says, Ya Wallahi, in any, in, especially in the environment of every Muslim house, there are two gifts which Allah has given us. If we focus on them with the knee of khair, Allah will change us. That's his promise. And what are those two gifts? The copy of the Quran and the seerah of Prophet You don't have to do anything. Just focus on them and make dua. Allah, teach me. I'm your Rabb. You are my Rabb. Just teach me. And the verses of Quran will jump to you, which you need at that point in time to make that transformation. I've seen this happening so many times with myself, with people I work with. We, whenever you read the Quran with just one dua, teach me. Rabbi zidni ilma, increase me in knowledge. Things will start changing. So the challenge is very simple. We all have to focus on the khair we have around us. Uh, what will happen to you if you get a beautiful mind? The first thing when you focus on the Quran and Sunnah is they'll teach you to distinguish between right and wrong, discerning. The second thing is, and this is the most difficult, the path of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the most difficult path to follow in this entire world. Why? Because all the beautiful people which we admire in this world, the actors, the actresses, the football players, the basketball players, the, 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 the tennis players, whoever we admire, most of them are not there. They are on the path of shaitan. They are drinking, they are whining, they are dining, they are womanizing. Oh, who do you find on the path of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? All the dry people like you go, guys. You know, heads down. You go into the bazaar, you're walking like this. You, you have a, 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 what do you call this, hijab on your head, a, a small beard, confused beard. You know, it's neither long nor short. And half the time, you know, you are doing astafar, astafar, going through this world. I mean, who wants to be in our company? We are dry people. Look at this, this company. I mean, is there anything fun here? Nothing. But Allah is so kind. In order to make this journey easy for us, he gives us three gifts. He knows his path is difficult. The first and the biggest and the most beautiful, magnificent gift is Hubbullah. He puts his love for him in our hearts. I'm going to share with you a couplet uh, where, by a poet in Pakistan called Elama Iqbal. And if you don't understand Urdu, then ask somebody who can translate it in English. He says, Bega na karde do alam se dil ko, ajab cheez hai lazzate ashnai. Bega na is, you, 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 you don't care for the two words, this word and the hereafter. Why? Ajabchi, this is such a strange thing to be in love with your creator. You don't care about this world. You don't even care about the Jannah. You just <coughs> care about the creator and you say, he is my beloved. I love him. I'm a Muslim because I love him. Second thing, Huppe Rasul. You think about the Prophet How, what, how, what he went through to make sure that we were able to reconstruct beautiful minds, his teachings, the way he went through life. And you start, over a period of time, you start loving him for what he did for us. And the last thing is the deen. You know, you love this deen because 
it helps us to move on the right path. These three are so powerful that when they start burning in your heart, it is easy to be generous. It's easy to be courageous. It's easy to be positive, energetic. It is easy to uh, be fussy and bully, good in communication skills. And over a period of time, this fire burns your ego out of existence. The ego is gone, the I is gone, and it becomes we. I is only for Allah subhanahu wa For us, his servants, it's we. We help each other. We think about my family, my masjid, my community, my ummah, my nation. Uh, and <coughs> as you become stronger in I, something very powerful happens in this journey. Allah gives you, it starts with yakin, iman. Iman is when you say the kalma and you say, Allah, I want to walk your path. But then over a period of time when you're walking his path, you see the miracles happening. For everything that you give up, Allah compensates you by his khair and barakah. All the money that you needed, somewhere it comes from. Every time you needed something, it is there for you, your spouse, your children. He st starts taking care of everything. First you were struggling and it was never enough. Now you are not doing anything. You are just walking his path. You are asking for his help, his guidance, and you are being taken care of. And in this path, the power comes from Iman, connecting, Kalma. That's it. Yaqeen, when you believe in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, without seeing him, his malaika, his prophets, the book, the day of the judgment, without seeing it, that is Yaqeen. Total, absolute trust. My Allah is right. And the last thing is Taqwa. Taqwa is when you trust him to take care of you. And you let go of everything and you say, Allah, you are enough for me. <coughs> uh, you continuously learn and improve. This is the path of Allah. Now ask yourself, what is this, hardware or software? This is the software of Deen. And I promise you, uh, what I have seen in this life, except Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, nobody can stop any person from succeeding if they acquired the software. This is what the Prophet gave his companions when they accepted the Tawa. We go to schools, colleges, universities, we spend thousands of dollars to acquire software to succeed in this world. This software, and this is, I've seen this with my eyes, it will help you in succeeding in this dunya and the hereafter. And you know what's the cost? Nothing. It comes free. It's your right as a Muslim to acquire this anytime you want. All you have to do is choose. All you have to do is ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and it shall be given. <clears throat> so what does this software do? Uh, the curve of mediocrity is where people's lives are governed by the environment they live in. So the environment determines the quality of your life. Right now, there are more than 60% Muslims who are living below poverty line. So what does that mean? Every time the dollar goes up, the barrel of oil goes up, every time something unforeseen happens, something happens in Paris, something happens in California, these Muslims, they get kicked up, kicked down, kicked around. The environment governs the call. They feel afraid to walk because they know somebody will come and abuse them or tell them something which will hurt them. The curve of excellence is where people determine what the environment is going to be. They, alhamdulillah, with the grace of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, they're so strong. The minds are so beautiful, magnificent. They can shape the environment. So, <clears throat> one day before the dawah, each and every sahaba, one of them was living on the curve of mediocrity. And this is the beauty and magnificence of this theme. As soon as any one of them accepted the deen, they made a quantum leap from mediocrity to excellence. From nobody, they became the most beloved of all the Muslims, the companions of the prophets or So two of the Sahaba Karam were very rich. So it was logical that, you know, as they took the quantum leap, for example, Hazrat Usman bin Affan and Zaid bin, uh, uh, Hazrat Abdurrahman bin Off. So when they made the, accepted the deen, 
Or you could say, yeah, they were so rich, you know, they had to be on the curve of excellence. But you know what is the beauty of Islam? That when Hazrat Bilal Rizdala accepts the deen, he also makes the quantum leap from mediocrity to excellence. He becomes the first Muazzin in the entire universe of Islam. Same thing with Zaid bin Haris, who was a slave. Same thing with Hazrat Samia, who dies. Same thing with Hazrat Ans. They were people who had nothing. And they make this quantum leap just because they accepted the deen. So the challenge was, what does this deen do to transform people from mediocrity to excellence? And it doesn't matter who you are, man, woman, child, rich or poor. All you have to do is accept the dawah and it will happen. So how was, how was it done? The first thing was, each and every one of them understood the vision of Islam. Now if you want to understand the vision of Islam, just read the ayahs which came in the first three years. What do they talk about? Consistently, they talk about the same theme. Kulhu wallahu ahad. Allah is one. Balam yakulluhu kufuwan ahad. He's supreme. And in the same breath, la ilaha illallah Muhammad Rasulullah. We worship nobody except Allah. And Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi is his prophet. So forgive my translations. I'm just uh, breezing through it. So this was the first part of the vision. The second part of the vision is the day of judgment accountability and on that day this is the third part of the vision you are proud of your wealth it won't work you're proud of your tall beautiful strong sons they won't work you're proud of your in-laws whatever you have in this world it'll be what Quran calls matayakali the only currency for that day and this is the third part of the vision is your good deeds your amal is saleh which you do from the day you are born to the day you die. That's it. So, understanding this vision. Now, to make it happen, you cannot make this happen unless we change our minds from mediocrity to excellence, from ordinary to beautiful and magnificent. So, the focus was on the 23 years of Dawa was building beautiful minds. The third was, okay, in order to build beautiful minds, where do you learn? From the Quran and the Sunnah. And the fourth thing was, so simple, so beautiful about Islam. Islam is not a theoretical religion. You cannot memorize Islam. Islam is about practice. Rasulullah in the 23 years of his dawah, he showed us practice. Hazrat Abu Bakr Siddiq he showed us practice. Hazrat Umar Farooq he showed us the practice of Islam. Hazrat Usman Ghani, Hazrat Ali Karmala, all four of them, they showed us how Islam is to be practiced. The curve of mediocrity is the biggest graveyard of talented and God-gifted people with no vision. Now, when you don't understand the vision of deen, then it is so easy to revert towards empire building, collection of wealth, because that's something you can show. I cannot show you my beautiful mind, but I can show you the clothes I wear, the car I drive, the house I live in. And the third thing is when once this empire building goes beyond a critical point, then there is disinterest in learning. Now I'm not just interested in the Quran because I think I'm too smart. That's what Karun said when they said, why don't you share this wealth with the needy? He said, why? I am the smart one. I earned it. And the last thing is once there is disinterest in learning from the Quran and Sunnah, everything is destroyed. And it starts with the qalb, the heart, and the mind, and the tongue, and then the children and the wife. Everybody goes to hell. Because we didn't understand the vision. We didn't build a beautiful mind. We didn't read from the Quran and Sunnah. So what happens when you make this transformation from mediocrity to excellence? Basically, all of us, we have tremendous potential to succeed. And I keep on saying this again and again. But what Allah is interested in is he gave us the potential. He says, what do you do with it? You walk the path of shaitan where you will see instant results, or where you walk my path, where the results may not be evident, but you will be rewarded in this world and hereafter. Now, in order to make this uh, actually, uh, the path in the path of shaitan, uh, this is very evident. Right now, um, America, Canada, Russia, China, India, Brazil, uh, Japan, Europe, 
They are spending trillions of dollars on their people to teach them how to convert your potential into achievements. Now, Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, 1400 years ago, taught the same thing to his companions to succeed in this world and the hereafter and to please Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala. Same methodology, but the goal was entirely different. So, how did he do it? This was the challenge, and again. We actually looked at the Sira, and this is our version of what you know. I'm, I'm sure, uh, I'm not even sure whether this is right or wrong, but this is what I feel as a teacher he did. The first thing he taught his companions was every man, woman, and child, you're supposed to go and acquire knowledge. Period. Khalas. Why? Is there anybody sitting in this room who doesn't have a problem? We all have problems. Why do these problems exist? Because the level of problem is here and my knowledge about the problem is here. Every single problem that we solve, we learn to increase the level of knowledge. And when the level of knowledge goes above the level of the problem, guess what happens to the problem? It actually melts and it becomes a part of your resume or something which you have succeeded in doing. And to make this happen in Islam, Rasulullah and the, sorry, Quran teaches us a beautiful, simple dua, Rabbi Zidni Elma. So you look at any problem in your life, whether it's finance, romance, studies, academia, you just say Rabbi Zidni Elma and khalas, it's gone. The most powerful dua to solve your problems is Rabbi Zidni Elma. And unfortunately, we teach our children to do it before the exams, after the exam, before the results, after, and then khalas, till we have our grandchildren. Uh, this dua, the most powerful dua in Islam, is tucked back in the Quran. The second most important thing is that his companions was added. Uh, and this he really taught his companions. First 13 years, persecuted minority. Very close to the situation of Muslims in the United States right now. And there he's, what did he teach his companions? Sabr, shukr, dua, and salah, period. You know, four things to fight uh, 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 this, this minority persecution. But when Islam uh, migrates to Medina, the Prophet and his companions, there perhaps the most beautiful day in his life was the conquest of Mecca when Mecca melted. I use the word melted because there was no fight. They just surrendered. And that day, if you read the books of Sira, what do you see Rasulullah doing? He enters the Kaaba on his camel. And history records he's bent double with humility. His beard is touching the Kajava of the camel. And his tongues are uttering word of hum, praising Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And shukr, Allah, you made this possible, otherwise we were not worthy of it. What was he teaching us? Each and every one of us will go through ups and downs in life. Normally, if you look at the life of an ordinary Muslim, when we are having a downtime, we lash out. Especially to our spouses, children, people who are weaker than us. And when we are having an uptime, we are so full of uh, pride, we forget to thank Allah why We think we are wise. So the challenge is very simple. The, and I, these days, the bad days are some more than the good days. So whenever you see a bad day, just do sabr, shukr for what you have, and then do your salah, do two rakah, and then make dua, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, please help me in this time when I feel powerless. And a dua which she used to recite was, Rabbi ni maghloob in fantasir. This was for the enemies, but also for bad days. And one of the other dua which she used to recite, a zikr was, Ya hayyu ya kayyum bi rahmati kastari. So under duress, he would recite this again and again. Uh, skills. Whatever you do, do it well. Asan was the word used. Habits. He had good habits. He taught his companions to develop good habits. Now, because he was the prophet, he wanted the Muslims to focus these four things towards the vision of the deen. And at the same time, he taught them what was the purpose to be a Muslim. Now, you read the whole Quran and the whole Sirah. There is just one purpose why we are Muslims, and that is to please Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Nothing else. That's why we do dua. That's why we do zikr, ibadah. We read this Quran. 
we do sayam and qayam, we do, uh, we do give zakat, we do hajj. That's why we do all our hakukullah and hakukulibad. Now these hakukullah and hakukulibad are the goals which are means towards the end, to please him. Now, they are so powerful, they are so huge, that it is almost impossible to, for anybody to complete them as they are required. So in order to do the best we can, Allah again blesses us with his three passions. Now, beautiful minds have two extras. One is self-belief. Self-belief in Islam comes from three things. We have already talked about it. The first one is when you do the kalma. That is the start of self-belief. You connect yourself to the most powerful creator of the universe, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Now, in order to strengthen this uh, bond, you do yakin. You can't see him. But if you notice, every bit of risk comes from him. Whether you have a job or you are a freelancer like I am, whether you are a housewife or you are a child. Uh, I realized this as a student when, I, when my mother and my father and everybody who was praying for my success, when I sat for my exams, nobody was there for me. And who was there for me? My Rab. That's where I recognized, Wallahi, the people who love me most, people whom I fall back on, whom I trust, when they are really needed, none of them is there. <clears throat> this is how this world is designed. When you are tested, nobody's there standing with you. So that day I realized, Yaqeen, he's there. <clears throat> and then the last level is Taqwa. Taqwa is the most beautiful thing which is taught by Islam to its followers, by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, to the believers, taught by Rasulullah sallam, to the companions. It is so magnificent. If you understand this, uh, we can transform our lives. Uh, how do we understand taqwa? Very simple. If the only purpose is to please Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, number one, and if we cannot hide anything in our heart and mind from him, how should we live our lives? Basically, there are no shortcuts for a Muslim. Even in the depths of the darkest place in the universe, I cannot hide from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So that means that the zahir and batin of a Muslim, the inside and out, has to be totally devoted to pleasing Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And how do you do it? That was the challenge. And one of my teachers, he taught me such a simple technique. I, in English, they say it blew my mind away. This is what he says. How many of you have a boss? Just raise your hands. OK, so if you want to do well with your boss, if you want to get uh, an excellent appraisal at the end of the year, you want to have a bonus, you want to have a cushy job, what do you do? Everything you do, what do you do? You ask your boss, sir, I'm doing this. Is that all right with you? Now, often you will do well, but if you make a mistake, the boss will do what? Protect you. Because you have taken his what? Consent before doing it. <clears throat> so, there are thousands of things we do every day. One of the things is we get up in the morning. Now, the only, th if you just do this, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, I'm getting up in the morning, and there are thousands of reasons to get up. But the biggest reason is to please you. What have you done? You have taken his consent. He's the, he's the boss of all the bosses in the universe. So you go to him directly and you say, I'm getting up to please you. Now you do breakfast and all you have to do is say, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, you know, there's so many reasons to eat this risk. But if the biggest reason is to please you, please, be pleased with my eating of this risk. Eating that risk becomes a body. There are so many reasons, reasons to go to work. But if you make this consent with him, agreement, that I am going to work to please you so that I earn risk a halal and tayyab with khair and barakah, going to the risk to that work becomes a body. There are so many reasons to come and stand in front of you and share this with you. But if the biggest reason is to please him, then this two hours of work is my biggest ibadah. There are so many reasons to go back to your spouses 
who are all the time upset with you. You don't do this, you don't do this. The children who are never happy, the house which is always dirty, things are going wrong, you know, work has to be done. But if the biggest reason is to go back to all that mess is to please Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, that becomes the biggest ibadah. There's so many reasons to go to sleep at night. If the biggest reason is to please him, that becomes a bother. Now, when you do this initially, it sounds as very stupid and strange. But over a period of time, this is what happens. When you make this dua, a beam goes from your heart and your lips to the seventh heaven. And Allah says, Wallahi, he's asking for my consent. He is my abd. And you know what I'll do? I'll protect him. <clears throat> and then, <clears throat> even if your steps are false, a gentle angel will come and he'll turn you towards khair, towards goodness. Even if you are doing something blatantly wrong, Allah will make it something good come out of it. Allah will be your guide, he'll be your protector, and you will see this happening. Just try it. I have seen so many people do this, that I... Whenever I come, always I'm afraid. It's a new masjid, new people. I don't know. And I make this to Allah. I'm coming here. There's so many reasons to come here. But I'm coming here to please you. And guess what happens? I find such beautiful, wonderful people like yourself. Even your children are quiet. Just imagine. This is the strangest place in the world where children are not making sound. Because Allah is here. And I took his consent. <clears throat> And when you do this with your spouses, the relationship of love, it blossoms. When you do it for your children, the connection with your bonding with your children becomes better. When you come to the masjid to please him, the coming to the masjid becomes a huge abada. When you, when you make this dua before doing your salah, that salah becomes magnified. When you do this before you do zikr, the zikr becomes your protection. It is one of the most beautiful things you do to become, but do taqwa. But this is taqwa when everything is normal, like in the United States. What is taqwa when everything is breaking apart? When <coughs> Paris happens, when California happens, when Don, this Trump guy he makes, does say something stupid. I'll tell you taqwa when everything is falling apart. Think about Hazrat Musa salam taking his people away from the Firon, uh, people of Firon, and they see the water body. Now when they look back, they see the armies of Firon. And the, the leaders of his people, they said, Musa, you have destroyed us. Now we'll be killed, something to that effect. And that time, Hazrat Musa makes a statement, which is a statement of taqwa. Inna ma'iyya rabbi sayati. My rabbi is with me. He'll guide me. So simple. So elegant. And the rest is history. Uh, same thing with Prophet Sallam. They're hiding in the cave. Uh, the kuffar come right up to the cave. And Hazrat Abu Bakr Siddiq says, Ya Rasulullah, what will happen? And Rasulullah Sallam says, La Tahzan. This is in the Quran. Don't grieve. Inna Allah mana. My Rabb is with me. What are you talking about? These people? When the rub is here, I don't care. So these, this is taqwa under duress. And ladies and gentlemen, uh, sisters, brothers, whenever you feel scared living in this country, whenever you feel scared anywhere in the world, you can't find a way. Inna ma'iyya rabbi sayati. Our rub is with us, he'll show us a way. And when you are confronted with evil, who is huge, and you can't fight it, then la tahzan. In the Lahamana. Self-belief is very powerful in Islam. These Sahaba Karam, they had self-belief. They changed the course of history. But their humility came from understanding that whatever they knew was a drop in the ocean. So learning for them was very powerful. The challenge was where do we start? We know this, but where do we start? And we were confused. And then somebody amongst the group, he said, or she said, I've forgotten. They said, just start where the deen started. It was as if 1,000 watts of electricity started burning. We saw the light. Ikra
learn, read with the name of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And that day we realized that Allah on that first word of Islam could have been Allahumma, Ya Rasulallah, Quranul Majid, Sayam and Qayam. But Allah chose Ikra Bismi Rabbik. Why did he choose that? Very simply, because he knew that from that day till the Jom Qayama, learning will be the most powerful weapon of a Muslim. Without learning, you cannot understand the significance and importance of self-belief that comes from Iman, Yaqeen, and Taqwa. Without learning, you cannot understand the vision of team, its importance, the purpose, the importance of the goals which are means towards the end. You cannot understand the power of Hubbullah, Hubbi Rasul without learning. Without learning, you cannot increase your knowledge. Without learning, you cannot improve your attitude, skills, and habits. So in the time of Prophet every person who accepted the deen, the first question was, can you read and write? If yes, then it's next step. But if no, learn to read and write. And the next step was acquired knowledge from the Quran and the Sunnah. And the third step was, theory was not enough. You have to learn to practice this. And the last thing was, that with the best teacher in the world and the best students in the world, it took 23 years to understand the deen. With broken teachers, broken students, it's lifetime. Now I have a challenge. I have one more slide to go, but I'm already 10 minutes up. What do you want me to do? Yeah? Keep going? I'm sorry about this. I normally don't do this, but this is such a beautiful gathering. I'm uh, just eating up time. May Allah forgive me. So what happens when you move from mediocrity to excellence, when you learn to con uh, convert your potential into achievements, which endear you to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in this world and the hereafter? You basically change your destiny. Your destiny changes, your direction changes. And how does that happen? The brain and mind, they do not evolve in a vacuum. They need an environment. Environment in Islam is governed by three, five things. The first is the religion itself. Think about the one-day-old baby. What do you do to the one-day-old baby? You call somebody who is slightly smart, intelligent, good, and you say, can you give Adan in the right ear back home in Pakistan and Akama in the left? The baby is helpless, but we do that. The last day on planet Earth, as a live person, the minute the breath leaves your body, you're so helpless you can't flick a fire. And then somebody comes, they shower you, bathe you, they drape you in two pieces of cloth, and they bury each and every one of us, man, woman, child, according to the Sunnah process. Now these two days are given. It's like every person, inshallah, will go through this. Now in between, Allah says, this is my path. If you follow this, I'll forgive you, care for you in this world and hereafter. But if you do not follow it, I'll destroy you in this world, which is happening to us. And I'll also destroy you on the day after, on the, on the day of the judgment. So this is religion, very simple, 101. In the religion, the most powerful building block is the family. In the family, the most powerful person is the weakest person, mom. Everybody is still complaining. But I tell you, this woman is so powerful. If she's making the right du'as, It'll change your nasib, your kismet, your life forever. And I'll tell you how. Maryam, Hazrat Maryam's mother, when Hazrat Bibi Maryam was in her womb, she made a dua. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, please accept this child in your service. A simple, elegant dua. And what happens? The child is chosen by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to serve her, to serve him, Bibi Maryam. And Bibi Maryam gets Hazrat Isa alayhi salam. Even today, I know people whose lives have changed because of the dua made by the mother. But most of the people that talk me about the dua of the dunya, the world. But what if the mother says, please accept this child in your service? I tell you, everything will change. So please ask your <coughs> wives to make dua for the children. And we should, as husbands and fathers, make dua for our children that please Allah, uh, accept us in your service, accept our children, our zuriyat, all children to come to the day of the judgment, please accept them in the, uh, for, for, for your service. Friends, friends are huge influence on us. 
I know of two beautiful, beautiful Muslims who had wrong friends. One is in jail for murder. The other one is smoking. All those things which destroy the mind. And I talked to their parents, and they had just one word to say. They had wrong friends. And then one day I was praying in uh, one of the uh, uh, interfaith chapels in the airport, I, and my son was with me. And we, we had to do Salat al-Zuhr, I think. And a young boy walks up uh, with a small beard, and he has done his budu, and he does his salah. So when the salah was open, he picked up the copy of the Quran and started reading it. And I wanted to talk to him and asked him a very simple question. Where did you learn this? And he says, well, we were living in some other city, and I never did my salah, I never read the Quran. I said, why? He said, because my friends didn't do it. So I said, how did you, what are you doing here? He, he was working as a baggage carrier for one of the airlines you know, throwing the boxes. And he says, when, we, when my father moved to the city, we have these three or four brothers who are my friends. So every time I go to the house, they're praying. They're reading the Quran. They're talking about the Rasulullah his sunnah. And over a period of time, I also started praying with them. They're my friends. So choose your friends wisely. When I was a woodcutter and parasite, most of my friends were woodcutters and parasites. Now that I'm trying to be a gardener, guess who are my friends? Look behind you, the Ikna people. Look around you, people who I come and work with in the masjid. You guys are my friends. You are my brothers. I refuse to call anybody else outside a brother who doesn't come to do salah in the masjid. Why? Because every time I have a problem, you guys will be praying for me. The guys outside, if I have a problem, they say, let's go to the pub. Let's have a joint, and it'll disappear. So choose your friends wisely. Choose your friend, Choose people who are better than you in the deen. So all these uh, uh, culture, Rasulullah Sallam inherited a mixed bag of culture, and <coughs> what he taught us was something very powerful. Look at the principles of deen. Everything, every part of the culture that's consistent with the deen is ours. Everything inconsistent, throw it out. So most of us, we come with a mixed bag from back home, from America. Don't deny or accept anything till it's consistent with the team. Last thing is organization. We all like to work for the organization that pays us the most, because we are all economic migrants, most of us, unless somebody of one of you came here to serve the team. So as economic migrants, what does the dean teaches us? Dean teaches us that Everything that we do to make a living is part of the deen. Deen is not part of my job. My job is part of the deen. So what do I have to do? Make, ask yourself two questions. Whatever work you do, two questions. One, does this job allow me to practice my deen? Number one. Number two, does this job allow me to take care of my spouse and my children? Why? Because on the day of the judgment, Allah is going to ask you two things. Did you practice my deen? Number two, did you take care of your family? That's it. Inshallah, you will succeed. So, go to the highest bidder. But if you feel they're not allowing you to practice your deen and take your family, make dua. Allah, give me a job where I can do both. And inshallah, something will come up. All five of them give input to the brain and mind. The output of the brain and mind consists of three very powerful elements. The most powerful is how I feel. Second is, what do I dream about? The third is, what do I think about? So when I was a woodcutter, guess what my 24-7 my feelings were to make money, to be important, significant. And lastly, uh, to be powerful. I used to dream about this thing. I used to think about this 24-7. But now that I'm trying to be a very humble gardener, you know what my feelings are? To give what I have, to share what I have, to care for whoever I can. Uh, my dreams are, big simple, six million gardeners in the United States. 
and you know we can change the course of destiny in this country. This country is going to the boondocks. Uh, Everybody is under debt. Everybody is living on a credit card. Just imagine six million Muslims saying, we can reshape this country according to the Quran and Sunnah. We're doing nothing. Changing yourselves and tying yourselves like this with other people who have beautiful minds. Helping the needy, orphans, widows. There is so much work to be done in the United States. There are so many people who are crying for help. People, especially in the African-American community, especially in the Hispanic community, especially with the poor people, especially in the slums where people do not know where to go. And we as Muslims can help them out and show them the path of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and his prophet and change the course of history. I know we can do it. I want to do the same thing to the country where I belong, Pakistan, because we are having same if not greater challenges. <coughs> so what happens when you change the triangle? The first thing happens is the words change. First I was trying teaching people how to make money. Now I'm teaching people give it away. You know, even if it's halal, you have to give hisab. And if it's haram, you are punished. So keeping resources with you is best if you spend it with Allah because he will multiply it and give it back to you. So the words are different. Uh, the actions are different. Now, first I used to be like greedy actions. Now it's open arms. Just let it go. Habits are different. I used to sleep, forget doing my salah, uh, you know, careless with my words, hurting people. Now I'm very careful with my ikhlaq. I say please, I say thank you to Allah and his people. I care for what Allah has given, gratitude to Allah and the gratitude to people. Totally, everything is changing. And I'm hoping my character is also changing. Initially, my character was that of Firon, Haman, and uh, 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 what was that, the guy? Karun. Now I'm trying to follow the Prophet and his companions. And I'm hoping that even though it's late, Allah will accept my tawba and he will change my destiny now this is the output that we give and the world actually for whatever you do uh, newton once said there's action to reaction something like that equal action reaction so the world kind of gives you feedback and one of the biggest feedbacks that i'm getting is the scariest they say you are a first people tell me you are a first class idiot and stupid fool you are trying to act as a gardener, you're teaching others to act as a gardener in a world that is governed by the Dick Cheney's, the Bushes, the Trumps. They are going to destroy you and the people. And my challenge is very simple. Even though I'm scared, when I read the Seerah of Prophet Sallam, from the first day of his dawah to his last prayer, he never even wavered once. So the question is why? You know, he was not a superman, he was a prophet. But why didn't he waver? And this is why he didn't waver. First of all, he took care of his belief systems. The Iman, Yaqeen, and Taqwa. He drew his power from Iman, Yaqeen, and Taqwa. Whether it was after Taif, whether it was after Ohad, or whether it was after Suleyh Debya. He drew his power. He recharged his batteries. Every day when the deen would, uh, uh, he, the deen would be in danger, he would revert to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But then, in order to spread the word of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he needed to win the trust of his people. <coughs> Towards this end, he developed the finest values of Quran in his person. Now, this is the key. The Quraysh, their belief system was on wealth, numbers, weapons, whatever material things. And Rasulullah Sallam, the belief system was on Iman, Yaqeen, and Taqwa. Values. This, again, is very powerful. He taught his companions that the best we can do is change ourselves. And towards that end, what is the first thing that changes us from a munafiq to a Muslim is sadiq. Speaking the truth. Why? If I speak the truth, you speak the truth, guess what would happen? We can trust each other. I mean, you give me an, something to take in custody, I return it. Khalas. I borrow something for you, I give you a date, on that date I return it to you. 
This is being Amin, trustworthy. These were two qualities he had throughout his life, even before the Dawah. Why? Because you cannot be a prophet if you're not Sadiq and Amin. Every single prophet from Hazrat Adam salam, to Rasulullah was a Sadiq and Amin. You cannot trust a person who's not Sadiq and Amin. Look at all your relationships with your spouses. If that relationship is good, why? Because both of you are Sadiq and Amin with each other. If that relationship is not working, primarily one of you is not being Sadiq and Amin. Your relationship with your children depends upon your being Sadiq and Amin. Your, your success in business depends upon you being Sadiq and Amin. Your success as a masjid depends upon each and every one of you being Sadiq and Amin. Your relationship as an Ummah in the United States with the rest of the world depends upon how Sadiq and how Amin you are with them. <coughs> this is the, what do you call the building block, the, 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 the base on which you build the edifice of being. It is built on being Sadiq and Amin. Unfortunately, we have stopped talking about it. What is the next step? Sadiq and Amin is tough, but how do you make it easy for the others? We make contracts. Marriage is a contract, right? So if every day, this is what goes on in a marriage, you haven't done this, you haven't done this, you were supposed to do this, you were supposed to, the bickering and eventually khalas. But the best marriages, what do they do? Oh, she was supposed to do this, she's tired, I'll do the dishes. He was supposed to go and get the groceries, he's having a headache, I'll do it. She was supposed to take, change the diapers, I'll do it. She was supposed to do the vacuum, I do it. So you give back more than what you get. Very simple. Every single beautiful relationship, whether between spouses, between parents and children, between us as Muslims, they are based on people decide to give back more than what they get. This was the third sunnah. Sadiq, I mean, he always, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, gave back more than he got from everybody. The fourth sunnah. I am very weak. I have many weaknesses. All of you have weaknesses. Somehow in the Ummah we have decided that the cleverest way of living is to identify weaknesses in each other and let them know I am smart enough to identify your weaknesses so don't get out of your boots. I can cut you down to size. So wherever you sit, what happens after a few minutes, people start talking about somebody's weaknesses, either in front of them or behind the back. Depending if they're stronger than them, they tell it to their face. If they're weaker, they say it behind the back. Now, what is the challenge? This is the challenge. I have been standing in front of you for the last one and a half hour. Now, there were many weaknesses in this presentation. So you get up and you say, Wallahi Nasir, you're a stupid fool. You didn't talk about this, you didn't do this, you didn't do this. You Guess what will happen? I will listen to you after five minutes. I'll tell my brother and Nikna, let's get out of here. I'm so tired. I have to go to New York. I can't take this anymore. This is one way. The other way is that, you know, I used to be strong. So if I had, you had done this 20 years back, I would have rolled up my seat and say, OK, where's your chin? Boom. And in Afghanistan and Pakistan border, there are people, if they disagree with you, guess what they do? They say, come, brother, I'll give you a japhi. And they press a button, and boom, they're gone, and you're gone. So this is what happens when you disagree with people all the time. You look for weaknesses. What was the Sunnah Prophet Very simple, so elegant, so beautiful, so magnificent. He would look for goodness in his companions. His companions had weaknesses. But you know what he would do? I mean, the biggest weakness of Abu Bakr Siddiq was he was very quiet. Just imagine a friend who doesn't talk. He keeps his mouth closed. But Rasulullah looked into his heart, and he found that he had the best qualities of friendship. And he said, you are my Siddiq. Even today, 1,400 years have passed. When we, unless we combine Abu Bakr with Siddiq, we don't know who we are talking about. <coughs> there was a man, Umar, sword half drawn. 
came to kill Prophet Sallam Nauzubillah, accepts the deen and guards the same man with the same half-drawn sword throughout his life till his last breath. He's serving the deen. And he's angry all the time, very agitated, gets agitated at Sibbil. And Rasulullah Sallam removes the agitation, looks into his heart and says, you know, you are brilliant. You can distinguish between right and wrong. And he gives it a name, Farooq. <clears throat> Usman is the Warren Buffet of his time, so rich, he doesn't know how rich he is. And if we have such a man in the masjid, we are always looking at his wealth. And we are saying, I'm smarter, why is he so rich? But Rasulullah Sallam removes the wealth, looks into his heart, and says, you are Ghani, you are generous. Ali, the simplest, so simple that, you know, he doesn't own anything. He's the one whom, who's, who became ultimately the teacher, the imam. And Hazrat Ali Raz Ta'ala know, Rasulullah Sallam looks into his heart and say, Ali, you are so brave, you are Asadullah. And then Bilal, who's, who just does the wudu and serves the Prophet ﷺ, takes care of him, Mu'azzan, and he says, what do you do, Bilal? I heard your footsteps in Jannah. Khalid bin Walid, the only man to defeat him in war, he says, you are Saifullah. So what was Prophet ﷺ doing? Throughout his life, <coughs> he looked for good in his companions, his wives, whoever was there around him, he would look for good. And then he taught them to develop that good like this. And then they joined hands like this. And they became the invincible community of Medina. We all dream about, we talk about. And the same community would transform the course of history. Man. So what's the challenge? I'll bet you anything that each and every one of us, after the first, third, fourth year, somebody whispered in our mother's ear and said, oh, you are spoiling this child. So what did the mother do? She says, OK, I have to fix him. So the mother said, don't do this, don't do this. Ping, ping, started. And you know, all of a sudden, the mother transformed. And then, yeah, just two minutes. Uh, uh, then uh, some things other changed, like uh, uh, you went to school, the teacher told you you can't do this, you got a job, and the boss was paid to tell you what you're not doing right. So you reach my age, and all you know is things you can't do. So what do you do in this world? Not much. When I understood this, I asked myself, what is something I can't do? And one of my students told, you, told me that I teach with ikhlas. So I developed that. And when I was coming to America, I made a dua, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and trying to teach this. Can I serve your people in the United States? And I met Ikna. Ikna's strength is they can reach all of you whom I don't know. So, you know, with the grace of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, we followed the Sunnah of Prophet I used my strength of teaching in the class with Ikna's strength of serving people with the class, and we became this. Alone by myself, I couldn't have gone beyond two or three masajid. Alhamdulillah, we have served more than 150 masajid in more than 15 states. Now, this is the challenge. Uh, how do you do it? The first thing is make dua for the niyyah. Allah, please give us the niyyah to become a consistent 24-7, 365 days a year gardener of Islam. That's it. We want to serve. And the second thing is, uh, make dua for yourself. And the most beautiful dua for Gardner is the first dua of the Quran, and it starts with praise for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Alhamdulillah, Rabbil Alameen, Al Rahman, Al Rahim, Malik, Yawmiddin. And then there is the aids, the submission. I worship you and I seek your help as a gardener. And what is the help you are seeking? Ehdina sirat al mustaqim. Show me the path. Make me steadfast, which is your path. And on that path, give me knowledge to walk this path. Give me, help me in doing things which please you on that path. Give me risk that is halal and tayyab, khair and barka on that path. Help me in meeting people on that path whom you like. Because they won't cheat me, they won't hurt me. And lastly, 
make me one of them. Why? I don't want to cheat others. I don't want to hurt them. I want to be your rab. I want to be your slave. I want to be like your prophet and his companions. And this is the beautiful ayah which describes what I've shared with you. And man and woman and children can have nothing but what they strive for, good or bad. So if you strive for a, being a woodcutter, that's what you will get. But if you try and be a gardener, I promise you, this world and hereafter will change. And the last ayah which describes this is, Allah will not change what is in any nation until they all collectively make a change occur in themselves. But this is the challenge. We cannot change the ummah. We can change one person. And after changing, we connect with people who are like us. That is why Ikna is so important for me. I cannot do this by myself. I cannot come to your masjid. They are the ones who provide the finances. They are the ones who provide people, volunteers, who drive me around. They are the ones who literally treat me like a, a petal in their hands and take me from masjid to masjid, sometimes staying up night, sometimes early in the morning. May Allah bless these people who are serving the community to the best of your ability. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bless each and every one of you for your patience. May Allah forgive me for overstaying my welcome by 35 minutes. And may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bless your children, your spouses, your ISIS. If I have made a mistake, please forgive me. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and all of you. If I have done something good, may Allah accept it as a reward and give it to all of you. Jazakallah khair. Thank you. Uh, Jazakallah khairan for coming, and I uh, want to thank our host, uh, Ikna, uh, Relief here, uh, uh, for providing us with an opportunity to host uh, Professor Nasser. Uh, we have weekly activities here, and if you would like to attach yourself to our weekly classes, they are uh, on our bulletin board outside. You can pick the class of your choosing, and inshallah, attach yourself to the masjid that way. And pretty soon, inshallah, February 21st is when Outreach Department will be doing a food pantry. I invite all of you to please take, uh, 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 participate in it. Uh, the details of which is going to be coming up on our website, and inshallah is going to be going out in the email. So if you are not subscribed to MCMC's emails, please do so. You go to our website, and there is a subscription uh, um, a form there that you can subscribe to our uh, email services. Once again, I'd like to thank uh, Professor Nasser for uh, giving us an opportunity to host him. And uh, please take some dinner. And uh, Isha, inshallah, will be at 7.30. Uh, Jazakumullah khairan. Assalamu alaikum. Oh, there is one last thing left. You are supposed to give the zakat to the charity in the same community and to the same people from where you are collecting it. So the original method of giving the zakat is to the same community. And that's why I can relieve this great job of domestically distributing 
um, the zakat funds and the charity on the other end. You know, one of the most powerful means of da'wah and communicating um, any message is to be a benefit to the people and to really help the people in the time of their need. That was one of the beautiful qualities of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. He said he knew about anyone in trouble, he would go there to help them in their difficulty, in their situation. And it's very important that when we have local, you know, natural disasters and issues and problems in different communities, uh, whether it be hurricanes and tornadoes or fires, that we are able to... Mr. Therese, Therese, come out. My house was totaled from Sandy, and honestly, I didn't know I was going to be doing it alone. But I feel like I got it through just the day that came and did everything in it with beautiful manners. Every single Muslim sister is our sister. We have a problem with domestic violence, abuse, uh, depression, anxiety, suicide. All these issues are ongoing. And so we need to be able to address the situation and be able to help those sisters. They need a place to stay. They need counseling. They need tabia. They need somebody to look after them, somebody to help them, somebody to teach them. And I mean, may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bless and reward and relief. They're doing something that is not just a fund to keep high in the community, but it's a fund that I want each and every single person to look after our own Muslim sisters, and they're doing that job on behalf of all of us. Sector Relief has developed a model, which I think could be replicated throughout the country. Uh, we provide extensive case management for our residents, uh, working with them to set goals for themselves and put it into an action plan. Mashallah, we've had many women who we've provided stipends for um, in a skill which would earn them a living wage and our goal is that when they leave us that they're able to stand on their own two feet. Muslims have a very clear role in helping not only in the inner city but indeed people who are oppressed and in need around the United States. One of the reasons I help to support this ICNA relief is that we are at a time in America where Muslims and the image of Islam in Muslims is very low in the sense that people don't have any idea that our values propel us to do good. Values for compassion and mercy and innate kindness and looking out for and the restoration of justice wherever injustice prevails. All of these are Islamic values. So we should be on standby, ready to go to help with donations, volunteering, with specialization, and indeed Ikhna Relief is able to mobilize his volunteers. <laughs>